Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm um, giving another talk uh, for the benefit of the hackathon. And again, for, for something that we can maybe point to um, in the future if, re if required. Um, this particular talk is going to be about the, the DSL2 pipeline structure. So this has come up quite a bit on Slack and I assume it will probably come up during the hackathon for people that want to convert their own pipelines. and. Um, and also, um, you know, others that may not know exactly why we have certain files in in the um, uh, in in the latest DSL two pipeline template. Uh, so, know the pipeline template. Essentially, all it is, um, it's on hosted on NF Core tools, and we have a pipeline template directory. And in that, we have all the boilerplate um, files that that are created when you run NF Core create. Um, you create a vanilla version of a pipeline where all the pipeline names and, and other information like authors and, and other stuff gets put in exactly the right places it needs to be to create um, a pipeline for you. So as you can see, there's the sort of ginger variables here that, that need to be replaced once you run NF Core create. So this is what the structure of the pipeline looks like. And this is what we continually update um, uh, in order to, to evolve the, the way that we're dealing with DSL2, um, uh, fixing bugs in documentation, adding documentation, um, changing the way generically that we're doing stuff. Um, and so this, this template is always evolving. And when we do a release of NFCore tools, um, every pipeline, the great thing about this, every pipeline will get a sync PR asking to update to the latest template. And so that's the way that the pipelines keep up to date. And so, the latest iteration of our DSL2 um, implementation would be would have been basically created um, using a very, very similar template and is most likely to be found in the RNA seq pipeline. Um, so this has now turned out into probably the most up-to-date DSL2 implementation that we've got uh, in terms of real pipelines. Um, and so if I quickly take you through um, what all of these files are, hopefully it'll make sense. So worth noting is that a lot of these files are actually the same as with the DSL2 version of the pipeline template. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of restructuring that we've put in and also um, siloing some, some, some of the boilerplate code into this lib directory, um, which is automatically imported by Nextflow at runtime. So these functions are found by um, Nextflow at runtime and they're written in Groovy, um, which is obviously what Nextflow is built on top of. So. Um, if we look at this in VS Code, so if we just go to uh, seek and open code up there, I want to see my Explorer. And so that will give us the same view that we've got on GitHub essentially, because this is a local clone of the repository. Um, just remove all of the additional files that I use for testing. Um, and so, what we have here um, are um, your standard files. So you've got the readme file, which is just bog standard um, readme stuff. Um, again, this a lot of this is created from the template with logos and badges and stuff. Um, you've got uh, an Explode config. So this params and test actually are something that I've added here. So ignore those for now. Um, and the custom config one. So the, you've got your Nextflow config, which is a standard Nextflow config file where you initialize all the parameters and, and so on. Um, and you include any other config. So this base config, for example, contains default resource requirements that is in this conf folder here. And so we're just including that in the Nextflow config as well as this modules config, which has become quite an important configuration file for, for anything DSL2. And so at the moment, it just contains um, a bunch of um, uh, options that you would use for each process for um, say changing arguments for a particular tool or, or changing the publishing options and so on. Um, and so this allows you to customize the way that you run these modules. And this has been around for a, a, about a year now um, and it's, it's tended to work quite well, but there are some downsides with it. Um, so at the moment it's quite a simple implementation in that this modules it's just an instance of a params. And so it's just a map that you can then use to have these options and pass them around from your main workflow to your sub workflow to your modules in order to change these options. Um, but we will be implementing a new um, a DSL2 native Nextflow syntax soon. 
um, which will hopefully simplify um, a lot of these things around. And so um, for the most part, you, you may need to add options here to, to change the, the behavior of the way a module is run because by default, all modules will be quite vanilla in terms of options in order to make them as, as flexible as possible. And so you may need to change um, certain command line arguments for your particular use case, like star align, adding all of these options, for example, or, or just publishing these particular files. This is completely developer orientated, so you can customize this as much as possible. So that's quite a key file for DSL2, which wasn't there for DSL2. Um, we also have um, a, a next low schema, which a lot of you know, which again, isn't specifically DSL2 related. It's just a way of um, having computer readable parameters specified within the pipeline. So you only have to specify them once in one place. And then this can be rendered in, in numerous places like the usage documentation um, on the website for launching pipelines to use in, on Nextflow Tower for launching pipelines. Um, it, it can be used in, in a multitude of places, which makes it very useful. Um, and so if you have any parameters you want to add, you can use the NF core schema build command with that will essentially just edit this file and allow you to change um, you know, fonts and sorry, not fonts, icons and, and descriptions and all sorts of other stuff. We have this modules JSON, um, which uh, is essentially the way that we essentially uh, we eventually decided to um, do version control with modules. Um, and so this is done by the Git SHA. So NF core the NF core module suite that we've got built in the NF core tools package um, has a bunch of commands that allow you to install, remove, update modules. And um, we use this modules JSON file as a standard way of, of tracking that information. So for example, if you if a new version of BB map, BB split has been added to NF core modules and you want to update and you run NF core modules update, it will change this git hash. And then that's the way that we're, we're, we're version controlling um, these module files. Um, similarly, you can also, um, there are options for you to, to stick to a particular commit of a module. So say, for example, the module has been updated on FCore modules, but you want to use the older version of that modules because it's using an older version of a tool, for example, that is compatible with your pipeline. Um, then you can um, have um, some restrictions in this .nfcore.yaml file that basically mean that you won't be able to update this module beyond this particular commit hash. And so you can only have this particular commit hash of this tool installed in the pipeline. And this is exactly why I actually added it for these RCC tools is because the latest version of RCC is broken for some of these tools. And so I don't want to update it and I only want to use this particular. So if someone goes on the NFCore modules and updates it, I don't want to use that. I want to use the older version. So you can restrict that and the NFCore modules commands will find this first see that it can't be updated and it won't update it. So that's this modules, JSON. It's got a Git hash of all of the modules you've installed with NF core modules. Um, the main script in DSL2 is ridiculously tiny now. Um, it was massive with DSL1. Everything was lumped into here because it's it was monolithic. Everything was done in one script. You had all your processes and boilerplate and everything in one in the initial template. But now it's, with DSL2 and the fact that we're using this lib approach um, over here, we can split out all of that into separate files. And so um, I've got this workflow main file that you'll see here. And so this essentially is for the main workflow, which is called workflow main. And so it allows you to silo away code specific to particular workflows as well, um, just to organize things a little bit better. So anything workflow main related called from this workflow, I, I put in that file, for example, um, and then all you're doing is, is calling um, the individual workflows that you have. So this, you can have more than one workflow. So for example, the viral recon pipeline has a workflow for Lumina and Nanopore. And in that case, you would have some logic here that, that basically just um, calls either of those based on some sort of user specified parameter. So for example, in the main script there, what we're doing is saying, if you've said by a param that you want to use Illumina, then you execute the Illumina platform and uh, Illumina workflow, otherwise use the Nanopore and so on. Um, so that's the main script. It's, it's much simpler now. Um, a lot of the boilerplate code is in, in these lib directories. We've got a license, which is MIT, very permissive, do as you like pretty much. 
um, which is awesome. And we kind of expect that for, for most of the stuff that we do. A code of conduct, um, citations, which isn't automated. It'd be nice to hopefully automate something in the future. So you have to manually update this um, and add the citations as you go along. But it's always nice to, to cite people for their work. So um, great to keep on top of that. Uh, a change log, again, standard, um, standard stuff. Um, that YAML file I just showed you. Um, this allows you to bypass some of the linting errors, for example, um, uh, with the RNA seq pipeline. Because it's quite cutting edge, we, we push a lot of changes into that pipeline that aren't necessarily in a stable release of NFCore tools yet. And as a result of that, we need to put exclusions in here so they don't, they don't fail the linting. When NFCore tools eventually will be released and those, those um, new updates are pushed to the new release of NFCore tools, then we can remove these for example, these lines from here, and, and it'll be fine. But this just allows you to bypass the linting failures by, um, by specifying which files you'd like to ignore or, or, or particular lint tests you'd like to, to ignore. A standard markdown lint YAML file for markdown linting with, with some configuration options. Git ignore files, attributes files, again, quite standard. Editor config, so a lot of these dot files are just um, config files for the way that we, we want to to, to lint and, and have particular um, stylistic, I guess, code within this um, repository. Um, and then you have these module sub workflows, workflows directory, the workflows, like I said, is just your main in for RNA seq, we just have one. So this contains um, the main implementation of the pipeline. Um, you include modules from, um, from the NF core, from this modules directory. Um, I, I'll show you the structure in that in a second. Um, and then you can also include things like sub workflows as well, which are a chain of modules, um, but not quite a workflow. So they're just a chain of modules that offer some sort of functionality. Um, so again, this is the main implementation of the pipeline. Um, and then, like I said, you've got sub workflows, local. This is a quite a commonly asked question why we have local and NF core. So I just went with this convention because um, I wanted to separate out any sub workflows that are built entirely from. NF core modules um, or sub workflows built from NF core modules. So you can you can have both. And, and an example of that would be um, maybe here. So so when you it's a standard sub workflow that just takes a BAM as input and then sorts it, index it, and sorts it, uh, sorry, sorts it, index it, and runs some basic stats on it. And so what I've done is I've I've got NF core modules that I'm using to do this for sample sort and index standard modules, but I'm also using a separate smaller workflow to do that just generate the stats and so this is also an NF core sub workflow and hence everything can then be put in this NF core folder. Um, hopefully in the near future, we will be pushing these all directly to NF core modules or maybe a separate NF core sub workflows repository. But for now, they, they, you have to manually copy them and move them across and install the relevant modules in order to use them. So um, it's a bit painful at the moment. Um, we will be having discussions at the hackathon as to how to, how to tackle this um, now that we've, the modules functionality is relatively stable. Um, so any sub workflows where you know, you're using custom modules or local modules, you would put in this local folder because they're quite specific to the pipeline. And an example of that would be, um, uh, uh, yeah, so here I'm using a local version of star align, so we can't really push that module, for example, and so I've, I've moved it to the local folder. Similarly, you've got local and NF core modules. NF core modules are modules you install directly using the NF core modules install command um, from NF core tools, and uh, it's just ridiculously easy. You install it, provide a name for a module, and it will install it in this directly for you. You don't have to do anything other than that. Um, local modules are those which are, again, specific to the pipeline, or you can't push to NF core modules because they're not generic enough, or, or there's certain other customization that you need to, to use them. And then we have these lib files. So you generally have one per workflow. So we've got one for the main, we've got one for the RNA seq, for the viral recon, we've got separate ones for um, example for the Illumina and Nanopore. And this just, again, modular, modularizes things a little bit. So again, you can see Illumina and Nanopore. Um, this allows you to then, if you want to strip out a workflow or rename it or do whatever you want with it, it just allows you to, 
to have things a bit more modularized so you can do that and update a workflow or remove it or do what you want. And so that's what these lib files are. Some of these are standard. This is to do with parsing the parameter schema and other schema related stuff. Um, this is for the NF core template. So it just contains the logo and a bunch of other color codes and stuff like that. Um, a utils, which is generic utilities for checking conda type stuff and, and joining module arguments. Um, and then you have, you know, you can customize this however you want for this. So this is used for the, the log information, the citation, the help generation via the schema and so on. So this is all fairly standard stuff. Um, and then you can start adding in your own processes and your own validation in this initialized function, if you like, for checking, depending on how you're running the pipeline and what the context is, whether you have a faster as input, whether you want to check it exists and so on. Um, you can then um, have other custom functions in there that you'd like to call in the main script too. Um, docs, standard documentation, a bunch of config. Like I said, the only different one really is this modules config where you have module specific parameters. Um, there are um, ways that you, you would then do this. There's some documentation at the, at the top. This will be changing um, quite a lot, um, hopefully in the near future, um, where we'll be using the with name directive to, to specify all of these options rather than having a custom solution, which would be pretty nice. Um, bin, which contains executable files for R, Python, Perl, whatever you want. Um, an assets directory that contains standard assets that, um, uh, you know, that you would require for the pipeline. So logo, multi-QC configs, um, the schema for your input file. So in this case, this just defines um, what your input sample sheet should look like. So it provides another layer of validation on top of the parameter validation where you're now validating the, the schema of the input file itself to see whether it's got certain columns and whether they match a particular pattern, for example. Um, and your GitHub file, files finally, where you have a bunch of workflows for running GitHub Actions, some, some templates that you would use for with that GitHub would use for rendering pull request templates and so on. Um, and I guess the most important one is this CI one, which is no different from the DSL one version. Um, it's just you specifying which tests you'd like to run and with which parameters, for example. Um, and similarly, you've got ones in order to be able to run the pipeline on, on AWS and, and so on as well. Um, I think that covers most of it. So overall, most things are the same. These three directories are the biggest difference. The, the, the module sub workflows and the workflows where you are now sort of separating out components of your pipeline into modules, sub workflows and workflows. Um, and then you have this local and NF core, depending on um, how customized and, and, and I guess local that these modules and sub workflows are to your pipeline. But other than that, it's, it's fairly standard. Um, Maxime, Rike, anything I've forgotten that I should mention? No, I think you're good with everything. Cool, okay, great. So I think that's it. Um, hopefully that helps and clears up a few of the common misconceptions and confusions with, with the, the new DSL2 pipeline template. Um, things do change, but hopefully we've got a relatively rigid-ish structure for the way that we will be organizing things in the future. Um, the content and the way we go about things will definitely change, but um, hopefully we'll be able to keep you up to date with that in the future. So thank you for tuning in. Au revoir. <laughs>